renew their minds. A renewing of the mind from the worldly, the worldly aspirations to the kingdom aspirations. And I was just going to take you through some of the things that we have been studying in, in Sunday school, because I, I know there are many here who have not seen this, but we've been looking at this book. All that the prophets have spoken. And I'm 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 gonna open this thing up. I'm still playing with my technology. And I'm gonna bring up here just some photos that I have been working with and hopefully Stan this is going to work yeah it says no signal and can you turn that airport on for me I think I may have lost it if that little light is on um, amazing technology here I'm using a, a little thing called Apple airplay and that is not supposed to be what's there I have no idea where that came from that's uh, uh, Apple TV Apple TV advertisement This is not working for me, Stan. It worked earlier. Yeah, I do. I, I've got to, I've got an AirPlay button and Apple TV. If this doesn't come up, I'm going to drop it. Okay, that's it. Shut it off. Well, that's one that didn't work till I get it perfected. <clears throat> but in this this book that we have been working on, all that the prophets have spoken. I was so impressed with this book because it asked two basic questions here. Just what did the prophets say? Do you know what they said? Does it matter? And of course, you have to ask the question yourself. Does it matter to me? And as I'm looking into this book, and I'm just going to take you through this, this lesson that we were uh, working with this morning. But before I do that, here is... Here is kind of the prologue of the whole thing. In the year 33 AD, the sun burned midday hot. All was quiet. Even the birds refused to sing in the oppressive heat. Cleopas kicked a sod of dried mud from the dusty road and drew a large breath and blew out his cheeks in a weary sigh. And squinting into the haze, he could barely make out the next ridge. A few miles beyond lay Emmaus, home. Sunset would be, on, would be on them before their arrival. Normally, they would have left Jerusalem sooner. After all, seven miles is a decent walk, but in the events of the morning had kept them hanging back, wishing for more concrete news. Cleopas had heavy thoughts, which jerked back to present as he as his irritated companion asked a question for the second time the two of them has been discussing the day's events the last few years events until it seems that no detail could be dissected anymore Cleopas was tired but more than that he was confused by all that had transpired in Jerusalem these days it had seemed 
life held more questions than, an than answered. Then trudging down the hill, they rounded a bend. It was then that they met a stranger. Hours later, later that same day, the same night, when the two of them stood hot and sweaty before their friends back in Jerusalem, for it was there that they had rushed. They couldn't give a good answer as to how the stranger had joined their twosome. At first, Cleopas thought that he had stepped out of the shadow of a big boulder, but that did, didn't jive with his friend's explanation. The bottom line was, they just weren't sure where he had come from. So lamely, Cleopas said to the stranger, had, well, he had kinda, well, just sort of just appeared. And that had been met with some derisive statements about the heat and too much sun. But of one thing they were sure, the stranger had taken them, taken that ancient collection of books, the Bible, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. The stranger's explanation of the holy scriptures had made incredible sense. He was also accompanied with a rebuke. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. This is in Luke 24, verse 25. And though Cleophas and his friend may have been slow to believe the prophets, once the stranger explained the prophet's message to them, all despondency and doubt fled their minds. So thrilled were they by their new understanding that they had hurried all the way back to Jerusalem to tell their friends about the stranger. Somehow, somewhere, they too needed to hear this message, the message that they heard on the road to Emmaus. So what did the stranger say about the Bible? A book that has puzzled so many, that many, that made so much sense? That is what this book is all about, and to understand it clearly, we will do what the stranger did. We go back to the beginning of the scriptures for a careful look, all that the prophets have spoken. I'm going to take you to, through a chapter of this, this book. Basically, I'm just going to, I, I, do, I want to read this to you. I don't have a sermon per se, but as we go through this, hopefully it just makes some sense. Here's what we have Abraham to the law. The disciples must have learned, must, must have leaned forward as Jesus launched into his explanation of the story of Abraham. Remember when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son on the mountains of Moriah? Abraham's son was under God's order to die, and since he was a sinner, he deserved to die. And Abraham bound his son and placed him on the altar, helpless. What God was saying was this, just as Abraham's son was helpless and could not save himself, so all of us are bound by sin and cannot save ourselves from its consequences. Remember how Abraham took the knife and prepared to slay his son? Abraham was trusting in God's goodness to provide a solution to death. At the very last moment, God called from heaven and stopped him because of Abraham's trust. The Lord provided a substitute sacrifice for his son, a sufficient substitute. The scripture says that Abraham named the mountain, the Lord will provide. And one would have thought he would have named it the Lord has provided. But no, he named it, the Lord will provide. It was as if Abraham was looking forward to a time when another sacrifice would be made, one which would provide salvation for the whole world. And 2,000 years later, in the same location, Jesus the Messiah 
fulfilled Abraham's prophecy and laid down his life as a perfect sacrifice. Just as the ram died in the place of Abraham's son, so Jesus died in our place. We should have died and been punished for our sin, but Jesus died and took our punishment on the cross. He is our substitute. If the ram had not died, then Abraham's son would have had to die. If Jesus had not died, then we would have had to pay our own sin debt. So down through history, every person had carried a certificate of debt, an enormous debt of sin that must be paid. The only way that debt could be paid was with one's own eternal death. But then Jesus came. His death completely paid man's sin debt, past, present, and future. That is why Jesus cried from the cross. It is finished. The debt is paid. But the payment made by Jesus is only effective if one believes, like Abraham believed, a personal faith. The scripture says that God honored Abraham's faith. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. God did that for Abraham because the Lord was looking ahead to what Jesus would do on the cross. And the Bible says, Romans 4.23, the words, it was credited to him, were not written for him alone, that is Abraham, but for us also, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. And remember that the word believe, as used in the scripture, has a fuller meaning than we sometimes give it. The terms faith, belief, trust, and confidence have the same meaning. Genuine faith is built on fact. Jesus died in our place for our sin. That is fact. Faith is not built on feeling forgiven. Feelings. It takes me to Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on, on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your paths. That verse tells us we can't trust our emotions. We can't trust our emotions. Just recently, I've been looking, watching a lot of air, airline crashes on, on YouTube videos. And they're going through the step by step. What happened to all these crashes? In most cases, it was a pilot error. Pilot error. They didn't trust their instruments in most cases shutting down the wrong engine when the when one blew out and just getting disoriented and crashing and they take many lives with them true biblical belief does not stop with mental assent to the truth it includes a heart trust a confidence in the fact expressed by a voluntary act of the will we choose to believe like example, I believe that Jesus has paid my sin debt. All of this would have been good news to the disciples. It should be good news to all of us as well. The word of God says, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The accounts of Abraham's faith and sacrifice were stories that the disciples knew well. Although they had heard them since childhood, now they were seeing the whole picture for the first time. As Jesus spoke, every eye was glued to him, the promised Savior, now in the midst. And Jesus continued. Originally, I was taken, and I had a picture of, I had a graph of the time frame 
from Adam to the cross and what happened at the flood. And I'm looking at this time frame, and Adam lived about 930 years. And it was Noah's father, Noah's father was born before Abraham passed away. And to, going back to their, that book of, uh, of, of Genesis, going back into Genesis, to Adam and to Noah, and I was just going to talk about the things that were going on in, the, in that, that time. And starting with uh, God is giving us a picture of the wickedness of the world. And because of what Jesus said to those to those to Cleopas and his friend, all of you 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 how foolish and slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So we know that Jesus has given his vote of approval on everything written in this book. So, if we go back to chapter 6 in Genesis and look at the condition of the world. And it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters of them were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them as wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh. And the word flesh means worldly as well. Yet in his days shall be his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. He's going to slow down the amount of years people could live. And there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came and unto the daughters of men, that they bear children to them. And the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his, at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping things, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And these are the generations of Noah. As Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was so corrupt before God that the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So make thee an ark out of gopher wood, and rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And so he goes on to show, tell Noah how to build this ark and then fashion it for his, his escape. In one sense, when I, I see the Passover in Egypt for God taking out Israel out of Egypt from their bondage so is God God is taking Noah and his family away from that generation and he's starting all over anew again so he has the ark and all in the ark are saved and going to the Passover, God commanded the Israelites to put 
the blood of the lamb over the doorway and on the side posts so that the angel of death would pass over so in a way the flood was a type of judgment just as the angel of death was a type of judgment in Egypt I thought that was pretty cool to understand all of that but I'm sure many of you have too but I think it's good to review all of these things from time to time and then of course my favorite of all is in John chapter 3 and most of you know what John chapter 3 is all about and I would just like to read from verse 1 through through 17 through actually through through 21 because this is the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus and there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews and the same came to Jesus by night and said to him rabbi we know that thou art a teacher come from God for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him and Jesus answered and said unto him verily verily I say unto thee except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of God and Nicodemus said unto him how can a man be born when he is old can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born and Jesus answered I say to you except a man be born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of God that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit marvel not that I said unto you that you must be born again the wind blows where it lists and thou hearest the sound but you can't tell where it comes or where it goes and so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? And Jesus said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? And I'd like to... I'd like to just picture Nicodemus here as an airline pilot who doesn't know his instruments okay he's on a doomed aircraft if he's teaching what he's he's been taught and we find that in 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 many times in the simulation simulators and for the pilots on these different aircraft they taught them some wrong procedures and some of these procedures actually brought down aircraft there was one flight out of out of New York exactly one month after September 11th 2001 just one month later the aircraft left Kennedy Airport flying after went into the air after a Boeing 747 they experienced 10 minutes later they experienced turbulence Pilot knew from his training when he experiences horrible turbulence that he should be pushing on his his rudders left and right furiously aggressively he pushed on these rudders that was what he was taught in the simulator the plane fell apart in the air and went down and they tried to figure out what was going on with this plane they found out that the tail actually ripped off of the fuselage and it happened because of the aggressive movement of the pilot pilot error brought down the plane so I picture Nicodemus and many of the other Jewish teachers in the same condition here But he goes on in verse 11 verily verily I say unto you we speak that we do know and testify this is Jesus speaking we speak of what we know and testify 
that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. I have told you earthly things, yet you believe not. How shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath descended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lift, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believed on him is not condemned, but he that believed not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, and neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they were wrought in God. Our deeds are made man. So we brings this brings us to that tipping point here. Christ died for all sins of the world, past, present, and future. But the turning point that separates us now is the belief in Jesus Christ, putting our trust in him. That word belief, confidence, trust, belief. Going back to verse 3 again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. We're not talking about water baptism here. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. He's very clear. This is our first earthly birth. That is your flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That is our heavenly birth. We are sort of like an empty shell, void of life. In one sense, we're all zombies without Jesus Christ. Now, the world's got it backwards. When the world says, we've got pictures of zombies out here, people who have died and come back to life again, and they're just uh, zombies, but... That's, that's not true because ever since when, when, when Adam sinned in the garden and lost, lost that ability to live with Jesus, live with God, all children born were like zombies, void of the life of Jesus Christ, void of the life of God. And the only way anybody can feel that is Jesus Christ's blood, death, burial, and resurrection and belief that he has done this. So, this is where he's saying, now, I'm going to pick on Zoe. Zoe, Zoe was born a Fullerton. She's always been a Fullerton. Her DNA is that of the Fullertons. That can never change. But she had to be born a Fullerton before she was given life in Jesus Christ. Because now she is a human and desired of God. And he wants to change her life. But she has to, ch she has to change her mind. And when she was a child, she chose Jesus Christ. And at that time, God gave her his DNA. 
through his spirit. The indwelling of his spirit is the DNA of God himself, which gives life to his children. And this is the portion of it that I claim and lean on that once you're born into the family of God, it won't matter what denomination you want to belong to, you are part of the family of God. And that is the most important part, becoming born again into the family of God. And as we read through the scriptures, he's given us more and more pictures of family objectives. Romans 10, 9. Paul tells us in Romans 10, verse 9, what we must do. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believed unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a strange thing to sit and think, oh yes, I believe. But when you open your mouth and say it, I believe in Jesus Christ. And you actually tell the world and you actually speak out of yourself and repeat it back to God himself who made you. Remember when Jesus entered, entered Jerusalem and people were praising Hosanna, Hosanna, and the Lord and, they, and, and the scribes and the Pharisees said, don't let them do that. And he said, but if the people don't do that, then the rocks and the stones will cry out. Jesus doesn't want the rocks and the stones. He wants you. And so I know this is pretty, pretty basic. Learning the sinner's prayer was basic in my life. And I would just like this congregation here sitting here this morning. Look at these verses and go through this prayer with me. Let's everyone just close your eyes and repeat this prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, I know you are the Lord of this universe. I know that you created this world for yourself and your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I believe in your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. And that he was he died and was buried. And Lord, he rose on the third day. And Lord, that he, that I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. That I may live with you forever in eternity. Now, if you have never asked Jesus Christ into your heart before and you have said this prayer, and believe it and trust it, then you know that you can live with God for eternity. I want to close with the one, one verse from Isaiah 55, 11. The Lord says, 
So goes my word out of my mouth. It shall not return void. It will accomplish that which I please, and it will prosper in the place where I have sent it. All right, we're going to have our last song. 